So I had a couple thoughts run through my mind as I was getting ready for today's sermon. The first is I wonder how many Philadelphia Eagles fans took encouragement from Isaiah when he said that you shall mount up with strength and have wings like eagles. The second thought was my first pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I really had never thought about going to the Holy Land before and came across a flyer that said $500 all expense paid clergy familiarization trip and I needed a continuing education event that year so I said what the heck, I'll go. The first place we went was Capernaum. The ruins of that city are enclosed by a wall and the guide took us straight into the city, straight to a ruin, and he said, this is Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit washed over me in torrents, and I found myself sobbing hysterically right in the midst of everyone. Deep, guttural, anguishing cries. I don't know if you noticed in the gospel that Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house meant that Simon Peter had to be married. We don't know anything about his wife. I also wonder if you noticed that Jesus, after he healed in that house that was just about a half an old town city block from the synagogue, after he healed all that evening and night, he went away to a lonely place. And when he, the disciples found him, they said, everybody's looking for you. There are more people to heal. There's more to do. Jesus says, no, we're going to move on to the next town. What about the people that were left behind? You see, Jesus was a witness a witness to God's power and God's plan. And the word witness in Greek is martyrion, from where we get the word martyr. Christians are called to be martyrs. Some Christians throughout history have offered their life up for the faith, and so we understand that use of the word martyr. But every Christian person is called to be a witness to God's power, to God's direction, to God's calling. And sometimes that's seen in very different ways. As I reflected on martyr, I thought of the life of Barry Logston. For those of you who did not know Barry, he was a family court judge in Newport News and died after a six-month battle with cancer. Barry was a passionate advocate, witness for our Lord Jesus Christ. And he prayed for this parish for decades. He was the first person I met and talked to when I arrived to begin my tenure. I was actually filling my gas up in the car in Midtown, and my cell phone rings with a 757 number, and I thought, well, somebody from Portsmouth must be trying to get me the day before we start. So I answered the phone, and he said, Derek, it's Barry. You don't know me, but I've been praying for you for months. That was the way he was, exuberant, passionate, loving, prayerful. And when he became sick, his role of martyr became even stronger. Usually you think of someone who eventually is dying of cancer, having everyone put their focus on him. What do you need? How can I help you? How can I serve? But everywhere Barry went, and everywhere Barry laid in bed, he blessed others. In the hospital, he prayed for the nurses that came and ministered to him. He blessed those who mopped the floor. 
Everyone wanted to go to Barry's room because he was the man that had God's presence and God's passion and God's love. Amazing, transformative things happened while he was in the hospital. The last time he was here at St. John's Church was on December 27th, our feast day, the feast of St. John. He showed up unannounced a month before he died to help bless the chairs and the chancel, to celebrate with us, to have prayers of healing for him at the altar rail. Before he left, he hugged and blessed and asked God's favor on me, on Clifford, on everyone who was there that night. I also thought of the shelter. St. John's Church is an incredible witness to God's love in Shelter Week, and we have Nancy Johnson and Claudia Tomlin to thank for the incredible leadership and organization they provide. All those bodies, all those people, seen and unseen, more than we had guests every night, cooking and cleaning and planning and picking up and logistics and all of that to make it seem so effortless was an incredible blessing. But this year, Nancy came up to me several months before shelter and she says, I just really feel like that we need to give people boots this year. And I'm like, okay, Nancy. So she got a Christmas tree together and she found out the sizes of everybody who was wearing boots that was in the shelter before they came to us, hung them on the tree. People got to take those, buy the boots, bring them back. People donated cash and we could fill in the gaps. And on Friday night, it was boot night. Now think about it for a minute. If you're on the street and you're relying completely on things that people pass down to you that are secondhand, boot night at St. John's was a disconcerting but wondrous experience. Two by two, they came to the back stairwell, the stairwell the children go up to the atrium, and they sat down and they said, what's your name? And they told them the name and they said, oh, you're a ten and a half, aren't you? And they're like, what? Yes, I am. And then the person said, oh, we have some choices for you. You can get tan, you have dark brown, you have black, or you have low cut. Which would you like? And you could see the confusion on their face. Like, what are you saying? They're like, which one do you like? So then they picked and somewhat hesitantly took the box of boots and were getting ready to leave. And then we said, oh, no, 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 sit down. Put on a fresh pair of socks. Try on these. If they don't fit, we got to find a pair that fits. We'll change the size out. And so with bewilderment, they're just sitting here in awe, pulling out all the tissue and the packaging out of the boots. You can smell the fragrance of the freshness and the newness, and they're just absolutely overwhelmed with excitement. My two favorite images. One woman upon opening the box squealed with delight. Oh, there's fur on the top. I've always wanted fur. And the second, a man coming back from getting his jacket and some other clothing that he found had discarded his previous boots. I'm not sure where they went. Had on his new boots. Came walking down the hall. Everybody, get out of my way. I have new boots on and I don't want any scuff marks on them. <laughs> Witness, listening to the Spirit of God and following where it leads. I don't know why some people get sick and aren't healed and other people who get sick are. I don't know why some people end up homeless and other people never experience that misfortune. I don't know why some people always seem to sail through life without a problem in the world and other people just seem to have trouble following them wherever they go. But no matter our circumstance, no matter who we are, 
no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, you and I are called to be martyrs, to be witnesses, to listen to the Spirit of God as Jesus did, to go where He sends us, to do what He asks us to do, in sickness and in health, for as long as we shall live, for you and I are part of God's transformation of the world. We have no idea what he's up to, but if we listen, we will change the world forever.